everyone and welcome to the second webinar in the series of uh, my marketing masterclasses. I think most of you who are on the call today were, were on the, the previous masterclass which was entitled Multiply Your Profits with One Simple Trick. And there we were talking a lot about the Pareto Principle, the 80-20 rule, and how that applies in almost all areas of life and particularly in our businesses, in the clients that we choose, the projects that we choose, and critically, what we do with our time. So today, what I'm doing is I'm following on from that masterclass and addressing something that has really cropped up for me in the last week. You know, when I finished that first webinar, I didn't know what the next one was going to be. And I've been finding over the past few days and weeks that a lot of people are talking about consulting. Somebody sent me a recording of uh, Frank Kern's webinar on, on the subject of really promoting consulting as a, as a really viable way forward for people who may have been in the information marketing space. And also Perry Marshall has launched a, a training product on that as well. So I think that taking the 80-20 rule to its logical conclusion has led to this idea that, you know, we need to move up the food chain. And consulting is the tip of the food chain. I've, I've talked a lot in the past about the, the uh, kind of value triangle, the, um, this, this pyramid, where we can have lower value products and then moving up to higher value but lower volume products as well or services and consulting has really always been the, the tip of that because it has an hour cost right? but what we don't want to do is we don't want to be spending a lot of hours doing low value stuff so this is make the move from web design to web consulting and it doesn't just apply to web designers in fact this could apply to pretty much any discipline any job that you're doing there are consultants in all kinds of areas from medicine to marketing so let me tell you what my goal is this time. My goal today is really threefold. First, I want to convince you that it's an attractive and realistic alternative to, to be a consultant from whether you're a designer or whatever it is you do now. Secondly, I want to convince you that you can do it. And then I want to give you as much of a roadmap as I can for how to make the transition, how to make the change from being a designer to a design consultant or whatever it is, whatever kind of consultant you could be. And I'm going to do it in three bits. So I'll just take each of those goals and the first bit of the masterclass, I want to help convince you that you really do want to be a consultant. Secondly, we've got a face that bugbear that we've all got, that nagging doubt in the back of our mind, can you really do it? And my goal here today is to convince you that you can. And then in the third step, I'll just tell you what to do. Right? Simple as that. Do feel free to ask any questions, type into the questions box as we go. I may not answer them at the beginning. We will hopefully have time for a Q&A at the end. So let's jump into bit number one. Yes, you do really want to be a consultant, okay? This is where I'm going to try and convince you to break out of where you are now, whatever you're doing now, and to move up the food chain. So let's have a little recap first, a little recap about 80-20. So the Pareto Principle, that's been around for a while, says that 80-20, sorry, 80% 80 of the results of the value that's generated comes from 20% of the effort or the input. Then also if you zoom in to that top 20%, right? Oh, sorry, the, of course, the, on the other hand, the, top, the, uh, the best 20% produces 80% of the results. The worst 80% produces the other 20%. It kind of mirrors. But if you zoom into that top 20%, it still applies there. It's fractal. So you, you, can, you can zoom into there and you, you find it's the same shape. It's a, it's a logarithmic curve if you're into maths. So if you, if you apply it again, 
then we get that just the top 4%, the most valuable 4% of whatever it is, can produce 64% of the results. And then zoom in again to Pareto cubed, it says that half of the results that you get, right, comes from just 1% of the input. Half of the value in corporations on the stock exchange will be come from the top 1% of corporations of 1% richest. And this, this pattern applies all over nature. I'm going to try not to reiterate everything that we covered last week. Um, I hope that you've seen that. If not, I hope you uh, get hold of a copy. So, specifically regarding you, regarding your work, and regarding what you're going to be doing in the future, how does this apply to your time? So I've got a real world example here. This came from one of our group hangouts in the last week or so, when one of our members, we were talking about you know, the typical types of projects that we do. One of our members said, I typically do web design projects for about $6,000, know, yeah, which is it's useful money. And then I said, well, how long does that take you? And, and the, you know, the team member said about 110 hours, if I'm being honest, about 110 hours. Now, Perry Marshall has got this tool, this amazing tool, and it's at 8020curve.com, 8020curve.com. I recommend you go and have a play with it. It's got different ways of doing an 8020 projection. It always produces this shape of curve. Right? This is based on this natural law of distribution. If I do a total output type of projection, and I say that we've invested 110 hours that together have generated an output of 6,000, i.e. $6,000, and hit the button. This is the curve that I get. And if you zoom in, you can then hover over any particular member or, or, or input item in that curve, and it will tell you what the relative output is. So what this is telling me is that the single most valuable or important hour that this guy would put in on the um, on on a particular project would be worth about eight hundred and thirty four dollars right and then it goes down from there and I've listed at the bottom of the screen here are the the, the top five hours eight three four four five nine eight three two three two five two two oh eight right so the top five hours that's about about four or five percent of the work is worth roughly two thousand and seventy six dollars the most important five hours that were done or that would be done on a project like this would deliver about a third of the benefit so there are things in any project in in a web design project this is likely to be stuff like strategy maybe keyword research if that's really important um, positioning working out the the user experience and researching and understanding the client's problem and researching and understanding their market okay all those things do not necessarily take a, a whole heap of time but they are incredibly valuable if, if you don't do them then the rest of it will probably go to pot then there's an awful lot of other stuff that goes into building a website, coming up with a theme, doing custom graphics, writing the copy. In fact, some of the copy, some of the headlines, if you've done the other stuff right, will have a, a very great impact, and they could be right up there in the, in the top few hours, in the top 20% or 4% or 1%. But there's a lot of other stuff down the bottom that really doesn't matter as much. And we'll come back to this graph in a bit. So the principle then, if we take that as read, that a web designer who has been well trained, part of my group, who's doing a $6,000 project, a third of that value is done in just five hours. And the other 105 hours are a lot less valuable. So what do we take from that? Well, as we covered last week in great detail, we should be doing more high value hours, more high value work. And that's really what we're talking about when we're saying to move from being a, a generalist designer 
to being a specialist, being a consultant. You do, you're doing more of the high value hours. It doesn't necessarily mean you're doing more hours. In fact, quite the reverse. I think to you know to work as to work full time as a consultant is not necessarily the right thing to do. So, applying 80/20, I think is more of a case about knowing what not to do, what to stop doing, what to quit, than it is about knowing what to do. We know all the stuff that, that we do now, but we need to f figure out, we, we do it all already, so it's not a case of what do we need, need to do, it's a case of what do we need to stop doing, quit doing, delegate or drop to leave the, va the most valuable stuff and then maybe start to do more of that most valuable stuff. So the challenge then is to say, is, is to know, to get insight into, well, what's in that top 20% or the top 4% or the very top 1% of the stuff that we do now. And that's the stuff that we should be doing more. And what is it that's in that bottom 80% or even the 96 or 99 percent all the other stuff that we need to delegate to somebody else where but the principle is that uh, these tasks should be done by the least possible skilled person the least possible skilled person if you don't have to do it right and it has to be done get somebody else to do it right and some stuff just doesn't have to be done it doesn't it really doesn't some web designers will think that every time you get a web design job, you have to open, open up Photoshop with a blank screen and create a completely new, original, custom design. You don't. There are great designs out there. There are great themes out there. There are loads of graphics resources out there. I've been saying for years, if you produce a design that's, that's great, use it again. Tweak it. You know, there's no point reinventing the wheel. That's not really the core of what we're talking about today. So there's this point on the 80-20 curve that I'd like to name the Clark Kent apex. And the idea there is that when you are exercising your superpowers, right, you are Superman, you're in those top few hours of anything that you do. You're performing at your best. You are delivering the maximum value that you can deliver. You are playing at the top of your game, right? That's your Superman time, it's your Superman hours. All the stuff down the bottom there, that first 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%, what you're doing there is you're doing other stuff that's actually covering up your special powers. Right? You're doing stuff that's keeping you busy not being special, not being super, and that's your Clark Kent time. So as a consultant, right, you're a, 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 a normal web designer, a normal doctor, whatever, they have to do that stuff. You find yourself doing that stuff. You take on work that includes ball ache stuff, Clark Kent stuff, and just a little bit of Superman time when you really make a difference. Consultants do it differently. Consultant doctor just gets pulled in. You know, they don't bother with all the, the needles and the this and that and the other. A consultant is used sparingly where they are going to be most effective. So try and get into your mind thinking, is this Clark Kent time or, I, or I'm, uh, am I in Superman time right now? So in this section, I've put together, these are just seven, off the top of my head, seven great reasons why you should seriously consider being a consultant. They are that you get paid more for less work and easier work. With less competition, you attract better, more serious clients that are likely to keep you for longer and there's less selling involved. So let's go through those and you know, tell me at what point you're convinced. Okay. Reason number one, you get paid more. I looked up some site or other which will tell you average salaries. Now these are salaries, okay, so these are full-time positions. And I chose web designer and I chose New York as the location. It's telling me the average 
pay for a web designer in New York is $75,000. And there underneath it's got a list of current vacancies or recent vacancies that, that it's found. If you change that to web consultant, also in New York, the average salary goes up to 115000 That's 53% higher than web designer. 53% more money. Now, many consultants are not in salaried positions. They're not in full-time positions. That's part of the idea of being a consultant. So I think that, that the, the, the real gap in real life is actually a lot higher than that, a lot higher than 53%. But let's work with that, okay? Reason number two, you can do less work. If you get paid 55, 53% more than somebody else, you can do half the work and, and be better off. In fact, you'd have to be paid double. But, you know, I think a consultant generally can, should be paid at least double. In fact, it's going to be a lot higher than that, as we'll see in a minute, right? You can do less work and earn more money if you pay better. Stands to reason, right? But we are, as I say, talking much bigger than that. The work, when you, were, when you are a consultant, gets easier. It might be higher level. It might be more advanced work. But guys, it's work that you're capable of doing now. When you're in your Superman time, that's the work that you are already doing. You know, what, what this is about is not... You don't necessarily have to develop new superpowers to be a consultant. It's just do your existing stuff, but more of it, and do it more effectively. So being a consultant means that you are very good at something specific. You get paid to do a specific thing. You have focused yourself. Now, it's easier to be very good at one thing than it is to be very good at many things. If you want to be a really good one-man band web designer, you've got to be good at graphic design, production, probably WordPress. You've got to know everything that's on the market in terms of plugins and all this kind of stuff. You've got to understand SEO, usability. There's a lot of things to be good at. And some of those, th some of those things like SEO, pay-per-click, if you're not very good at them, you're not going to get very good results. It's the 80-20 curve again. The best people the best few people get by far the highest results. The majority of people don't. It's the same with the distribution of clicks on the search engine. If you can get to the top few positions, you will get the lion's share of the clicks. Right? And who gets there? The very best people. It's hard to be good at everything. I've got a picture here of Yoast. Yoast is a specialist. If you've not heard of him, Yoast does uh, consulting work and generates, uh, creates products that are generally in the WordPress meets SEO area. Uh, Jonathan's just put, he's very good, and he is. Now, is he good because he specializes, or does he specialize because he's good? I'll leave you with that question. Reason number four. By the way, if anyone's convinced now, feel free to, you know, leave the webinar and go off and stop being a consultant. But if you uh, don't mind, I will take a little bit more of your time and hit you with more reasons. Here's reason number four. There's less competition for consultants. This is a very crude test I ran today. If you type web designer into Google, it comes up with 415 million results. If you type web consultant into Google, it comes up with 160 million results. So there's 159% more mentions of web designer on Google than there are web consultant. It doesn't really prove an awful lot, but we know, common sense says, there's a lot of web designers out there and that there's a lot fewer web consultants out there. The higher up the food chain you go, the fewer competitors there are. There are innumerable bacteria in the world right and then you've got little things like krill and little tiny bugs and there's there's squillions of those things they get eaten by a smaller number of bigger things and those little things get eaten by other things right and then you get large predators like blue whales 
or uh, lions, great white sharks, and there's not so many of them around. There's a lot more of the smaller things. The higher up the food chain you go, the fewer competitors there are. Doug's asked the, Doug's asked the question, okay, maybe there's less competition, but what about the demand? You know, is there a lot of demand for web designers? Is, is there a lot of demand for web consultants? I haven't done an exercise on that right now. However, we will find out in a minute that we, even with less demand out there, you can still benefit. Remember, you're getting paid more, right? So you don't need to be busy 100% of the time. As a consultant, you will also attract more serious clients. Here's just two people. One person is thinking, I need a web designer right now. The other person is saying, I need a consultant right now. The person who thinks I need a web designer might be thinking, oh, I'll get to you know, give them my brief, tell them what I want, tell them what colors I like. You know, uh, Basically, they might think they're going to run the game. And anyone who's been in web design will know exactly what I'm talking about. Somebody who wants to bring in a consultant, however, wants somebody with a high level of skill that they can trust to be an expert, to do the job right. So the client is more serious. Their expectation is higher. They want you to be an expert. Yeah, They're going to rely on you and they're going to give you what you need to succeed because the stakes are higher. So what would you rather have, a client that's thinking, I need a web designer, or a client that's thinking, I need a consultant? Now, I have to acknowledge the idea of just saying, I'm a consultant, and stepping up could be quite scary at this point. And we're going to address that in the uh, this second half of the presentation. Reason number six, generally, consultants will be kept for longer. I had a, con a consulting position that was well paid for three years. It started out at three months and it carried on for three years at consulting rates. We're talking $500 a day for three years. Okay. I don't know any web designer, freelance web designer, who will be on the same job typically for, for three years. What happens with web design is client will hire you to do a web design project. When the project is finished, it's over. You get your money, and then you have to go back again. You have to find another client. You have to make another sale. Plus, a lot. Although it, it is an, an amazing uh, job to do, web design. It's fascinating. You get to meet and play with loads of different kinds of clients um, who've got all kinds of different business problems. But after a while, still, you do find that you're kind of applying the same stuff over and over again and projects may start to look the same if you're a consultant imagine being hired for six months right I've never done a web design project that's taken more than six months or even a web development project that's taken that long with all the, the coding and I don't think more than six months now if you're working with one client for six months you get the opportunity to get really intimate with their business model, with their clients, with their prospects, with the way their business runs. You get to learn incredible lessons about the market and the behavior. And if you're doing stuff like split testing, you'd be generating a lot of value. And that value goes into your bank of expertise that is good for the customer and is also good for you. It doesn't really help you to do the same type of project more than once. Yeah, it's like being a, a tennis player and just playing the same level of person all the time. You want to be moving up. You want to up your game. Doing the same kind of web design for the same kind of client day in, day out, month in, month out, isn't really going to up your game. So consultants more often retain for a monthly fee. And you get these deeper projects that are more challenging and they may make you better at what you do. Now, selling. Nobody really likes selling. Selling's a, selling's a pain. Let's just talk about it in terms of raw numbers. Let's say you want to earn $125,000 a year. I'm not saying this is 
you know what you should be asking for it may be higher it may be lower depends on what you feel you're worth actually but also what you what you need to get by but to earn $125,000 a year and you're doing $6,000 website projects you need to make 21 sales to meet that $125,000 target and you also have to deliver 21 different projects to 21 new clients compare that to consulting let's say that you are you're bringing on clients on a $4,000 per month rolling contract to earn 125,000 that way you only need to make three sales yeah it's actually two and a half now, three four thousand dollars twelve thousand a month over twelve months it's hundred forty four thousand dollars yeah you only have to make three sales compared to 21 sales so there's less selling to do and we know that the 80 20 rule says that we we shouldn't take on every client because your best 20% of potential clients will give you 80% of the income or profits or value or satisfaction the bottom 80% will give you only 20% of those things 20% of those great benefits so we we should be finding ways to ignore or avoid or cut off trim away those bottom ones what that means is that if you go to 100 sales meetings in the year 80 of those are probably wasted unless you've segmented your market really really well and qualified everybody really well but there's always going to be wasted time in sales so if you've got to make however many it was 21 sales in a year that's a lot of selling if you've only got to make three it's a lot less selling it's a lot less wasted time selling as well plus if you specialize to the point where you are the person for a particular niche particular area you'll find that jobs come to you I don't go out to get clients clients come to me because of the stuff that I've already put out in the world I've made a name I've made a niche so let's just uh, recap on the seven reasons to be a consultant you get paid more for less work easier work with less competition and also remember when you specialize there's a lot less competition and um, being a consultant means specializing to a degree a web designer is a very very broad role there's some very very untalented web designers out there with low skills low capability All right it's hard to stand out as a web designer so if you specialize there is less competition um, for example I mean just thinking about I've got one client I was working with recently when they need something special doing with Google Analytics they bring in a Google Analytics consultant right that's a special type of consultant there'd be WordPress SEO consultants like Yoast this is a Google Analytics consultant just specializes in one particular thing that they do really well and guess what they'll charge charge high prices for that when you're a consultant you attract more serious clients who expect more from you which is a good thing by the way they're also like like likely to keep you for longer and you've got less selling to do seven very very good reasons to pay attention for the next two bits of the webinar so what you then get is a virtuous cycle that's very different to saying I'm a web designer I'm gonna get a bit more efficient over time get a bit faster might get a bit more skilled a bit more experienced but basically I'm doing the same kind of projects for the same kind of clients for the same kind of money more or less over time move up the food chain and we get a business model that, that kind of self generates and improves and let me explain how that works first you specialize you say I'm gonna stop doing any of the Clark Kent stuff I'm just gonna do my Superman stuff just gonna exercise my superpowers all week long and when I'm not doing that I'm gonna be resting and recharging my superpowers so when you specialize and you do higher value work that then generates more money 
okay, frees up some time that lets you delegate the lower value work to others. You've then got spare time to do some special things, thinking, training, learning, maybe even retreating, having a rest, taking a break. You will have time to do those things when you do higher value work, which, by the way, we've already proved you're capable of doing. This isn't a, a choice. You don't have to change anything about yourself. We're not talking about any new powers. We're talking about stuff you already do when you're not busy being Clark Kent. So when you've got the spare time to think and train and learn, that can develop your special powers further. You can sit down and read a book. You can go to a conference. You can sit on calls because you've got the time to do it. The more you strengthen your special powers, the stronger your proposition gets, which then lets you command higher fees. And you're developing and you're growing, which then helps you specialize more. So then we hit the repeat button and it goes round and round and round. That's the situation we want to be in. Just imagine every week, not just learning about the latest plugin that's come along that makes your life a bit easier, but learn how to be even more the best even more this particular specialist you know this this isn't just about web design or marketing you could be an art historian right? if you generate if you create the time for yourself to become the absolute best in the time that's available because we've all just got one life on this earth right and we've all got seven days in a week and we've all got 24 hours in a day so we really shouldn't be wasting our time pretending and hiding our superpowers under your Clark Kent suit and your glasses. Practice. We should be practicing those great skills. Making them better. So that's the end of the first part. I hope that uh, you're starting to think, actually, that sounds really, really good idea. If anyone's thinking, no, I don't think it's a... Not, not really for me, then pay attention to the next one because behind that thought is probably, I don't think I could do it anyway, not really. Well, actually, I believe you can. I don't think it takes anything that you haven't already got in you to make that step up. It's just a question of taking the best of your knowledge, the best of your skills, the best that you can do, the best that you can offer and apply more of that and like we say it's all about what you don't do what you stop doing what you quit what you drop what you delegate so this next section is entitled yes you can do it so let's start <clears throat> we'll review this graph again remember the top five hours number one hour likely to be worth 834 dollars Let's look at some numbers. Now that $834, I have to say, is what you're really worth. Okay? This isn't pretend. That, that is the distribution that we find in life all over the place, and it applies to your time, whatever you do. Look at it one way. You do a $6,000 project, right? It takes 110 hours. That works out at an average of $54 an hour. That's the value that you're delivering, $54 an hour. Take just the top five hours. There's $2,076 worth of value in five hours. That works out at $415 an hour. That's eight times more. Eight times more. And that's the top five hours. The top one was over $800. That's 16 times more, the average. So what I would say is whatever you're doing now, whatever you're charging now, whatever your, your work situation says that you're worth right now, you are actually worth at least eight times more when you do your best work. So there's a real challenge there. This isn't mumbo jumbo this is the truth if you are doing six thousand dollar projects in 110 hours you probably could be delivering work that's worth eight hundred dollars in an hour 
right? And I'm not saying you should go out and charge $800 an hour, necessarily. I'm saying that you're capable of delivering that much value in an hour if the value of the project is 6000 to the client. So value is starting to come up. It's all about what, what value can you create? Yeah, not just about what you can charge. So the challenge for us is just to admit that. Admit that we are actually eight times more valuable than we are actually practicing right now, at least eight times more valuable. It's a big challenge. So let's look at some excuses. Right? What are the reasons why we may not think we can do it? And then let's tell the truth about some of those things. So we'll start with, but, but my clients will never pay that. First question, have you tried? There's no point saying, yes, I do websites for between four and eight thousand dollars. And then you get clients who come along and, you know, the ones who say yes are the ones that are willing to pay between four and eight thousand dollars. Right. And you get that kind of client and that's what you get all the time. OK. Have you tried saying I will do this and it's twenty thousand dollars? Because if not, you can't say that your clients will never pay that. All they've done is agree to the price that you gave them before. And look, even if your old clients are, are you know, playing the, doing business at a particular level that really $6,000 is all that makes sense to them and paying more would not be cost effective, right? That may be true. So maybe your old clients wouldn't pay five, eight, 20 times more, but your new clients will because you'll be fishing in a different pond, right? If you go to the same pond every day using the same kind of bait, the same bit of the sea, you always pull out the same kind of fish that is attracted to that kind of bait. Don't tell me that the sea is all full of that kind of fish just because that's the only type of fish you've pulled out with that bait. Try a different bait really try it with conviction then you might find that there's a lot more out there than just what you've managed to uh, to attract now Sarah's just reminded me on the on the questions that, that we've got um, a partner in Australia uh, that we interviewed and the interview is on the pro web design course content if, if you're on the pro web design course I think in month seven um, what he did was he fired all of his clients apart from one. Then he did a profile of that client. What is so great about that client? And then he's gone out to find new clients like that. In fact, he went back to that one client and said, I'm putting my rates up. And did he put his rates up by about six times? And the client said, okay, because he was delivering that much value to that particular client. All the other clients were paying him Clark Kent fees for Clark Kent stuff, right? This particular client was getting a Superman service and they knew the value that they were getting. So when he turned around and said, yeah, my fees are going up six times, the client barely batted an eyelid. So don't think your clients will never pay that just because the clients that you have now have never paid that. How about... But, but I don't know where to find these clients. Well, that's the same kind, of, same kind of thing. They might be right there. They might be visiting your website and then going away again. Where did you find your current clients? What did you do to find them? Yeah, they're only people. And clients are only people. They, they are managers, they have businesses, whatever. They're out there. It isn't a big scary world you've done it before do it again just do it with slightly different clients I don't think I'll be able to keep a straight face good skill and this is very very important because if you don't believe if you skip the step where you have to admit that you're worth more than you're charging now unless you believe it you're not gonna be able to keep a straight face and I've got two tips for you, two methods. Number one is the JFDI method, the just fucking do it. Okay? 
commit yourself to it throw yourself into it you can't have one foot on the boat and one on the shore it doesn't work you're going to get wet right you've got to go for it secondly use the three p's when my kids say to me you know how, how do i get good at something i say it's the three p's and they know what that means and they stand for three p's stand for practice practice and practice practice on your family practice in a mirror so yes my my rate is a thousand dollars an hour but my rate is eight hundred dollars an hour five thousand dollars a day if you want to hire me as a consultant okay practice it say it get used to the sound of those words practice on your cat yeah say to your cat thousand dollars an hour yeah when your cat believes you move on it's not it's hard to say you know what the real reasons are or where it may come from our, our sense of undervaluing ourselves and to some degree I think maybe it just doesn't matter you know, you, did you get knocked back at school? Did somebody, somebody tell you you were stupid at school? Did you have an experience when you were growing up that you were embarrassed about and decided, I'm never going to put myself out there again, I'm never going to risk it, right? And we do that when we grow up, you know, especially around that sensitive age that, you know, from like 10 to 13 or maybe the rest of the teenage years when you're, you're trying to find out, discover who you are, decide who you are and other people's opinions matter so much to you that stuff you know as we know goes away as you get older but it seems like we make decisions around that time that stick with us and one of the big decisions is I'm not gonna not gonna risk it, you know I'm not gonna risk the example I, I love to use I'm not gonna risk asking the prettiest girl in the school out for a date right it could be great if she says yes, but if she says no, the world will come to an end and I will probably die of shame. So we get into the habit of playing safe and sticking with the status quo and not taking risks. The re reality is the world um, rewards the risk taker. Fortune favours the brave. Is that the motto of the SAS, I think? So practice it. Yeah? Get out there and look, if it, does, if it doesn't work, go back. Go back to what you've done before. Okay, but just, just, just do it. It's, it's only a game, it's just a ride anyway. How about, there will always be people who are cheaper than me. Yes, there will. That's just a fact of life and it doesn't mean anything. Because cheaper does not mean better value. You know that, right? You do know that. We all know that. We don't all buy the very cheapest shoes that are out there. We buy pretty much the best that we can afford because that's generally better value. Buy a well-made pair of shoes. I've got a pair of shoes that have lasted me nearly 20 years, right? I think they cost about £100, $150, something like that. And I wore those at work for years and years and years and years and I still have them and they still look and look great work great hundred pounds for nearly 20 years worth of use that's five pounds a year now you go out and fight and buy a five pound pair of shoes though that pair of shoes is not gonna last you a year cheaper doesn't mean better value it just means cheaper this morning right here's a perfect example of this this morning I went and bought this thing it's a inhaler clears your nose out I was in the supermarket and there were two and this one was two pounds something and there was another brand an Olbus inhaler right it was next to it. it was like one pound so it was half the price of the VIX one and I remember noticing myself having a conversation in my head about which one I wanted because I trust the Olbus brand okay it's there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever but yet I picked up the VIX one which is twice the price and I remember thinking to myself I wonder if the ingredients are the same but I think part of it simply came down to I picked up the more expensive one because I wanted it to work didn't want to take a risk I needed it to work I wanted to be able to breathe clearly I've got a webinar to give so I paid double 
for something which may be exactly the same. Okay? Some people will always pay. There are companies that are part of their purchasing procedure is to, to get um, lots of tenders in and throw away the bottom one and maybe throw away the top one. Right? Just, just as a matter of course. Because it's their habit not to get the cheapest. That's true. Derek saying, um, talking about the fear of failure, saying successful people tend to fail more times than unsuccessful ones. If you don't try it, you'll never know. There will always be cheaper people than you, but <clears throat> let's remember that we're talking about value. We're not talking about cost. What are you selling? Okay, and, and really importantly, I want to get out of the idea that we're selling hours, right? When you get a web design project, you might sit down and think, well, it's going to take me about 110 hours, okay, which equates to pretty much a month. Um, that means I need $6,000 in to give me the $5,000 that I need to, to live off and survive, right? You, what, we, what that is, is we call it aiming for the bar, like in high jump. If you aim for the bar... If you aim for just enough, you aim for the bar, you'll probably hit the bar. If you aim for the air you know, that's clearly above the bar, you aim for the sky, you'll probably clear the bar. I used to do a lot of mountain biking, and I learned that when I was on a trail with rocks in it, if I looked at the rocks, I would hit the rocks, get bump, bumped off. I had to look at the gaps only. i focus on the gap, and you know, where your attention goes, your energy flows. Or what we resist persists. There's a lot of little aphorisms around telling you the same kind of thing. Now, there will always be people cheaper than you, by the, maybe by the hour, right? But we're not offering an hourly price. We are offering value, and we are getting compensated as a proportion of that value. So if you walk into your house and you find that there is water coming through the ceiling, you need a plumber, you need a plumber now, because it, it, the, the cost almost doesn't matter. Because the value of what you're getting is you could save thousands and thousands and thousands in potential loss, right, if this leak is not contained quickly. So you'll get, what you want is the first plumber who can get there who can fix the leak. You want an emergency plumber. I had a block toilet at my sister's house. I paid a guy, I think he charged 60 pounds, and he turned up and he did it in one minute. Unblocked this thing. I, it had taken me an hour, right? That 60 pounds, well worth it for me. Well worth it. So we're offering something to the client that is worth more to them than the fee that we're charging. And while that's the case, it's fine. I know that a lot of you will have read the, um, the Art of Selling Anything book. If not, have a look it up online. I think it's called The Art of Selling Anything. And there's a free PDF available online. Basically, what that says is that any transaction like the transaction with you selling your services to a client is a trade. And here's how a trade works. What you are getting from the trade is worth more to you than what you're giving, than what you're giving up. And the same is true for the other party in the trade. What they're getting is worth more to them than what they're giving. So you are rich in design experience or marketing experience or whatever kind of experience it is. Right? You might know an awful lot about fixing people's hearts. Okay? That doesn't cost you very much to have that. And it doesn't cost you very much to practice it, to spread the knowledge. So when you've got somebody who's got a leak in their house, or they've got you know, heart problems, or they need a website doing, it costs you a certain number of hours or whatever because of your experience to, to fix that but you're delivering an immense value and then what somebody can go and do with that value is is you know really profit from it okay 
you, you implement this, that can generate a lot of profit or take away a lot of pain. So what you're giving up is a few hours. Might be two hours, might be 110 hours. Right? But, and then you're charging a fee for that. Okay, so what you're getting is you're getting a fee that's worth a lot more to you than those few hours. And the client is getting something that's very important for them, that's more important than the fee they're giving up. So you've got to trade, and that's how the world works. Here's another question. I don't know how to charge. Well, there's no... We, we are going to talk about this actually in a, in a minute, in the do this section. But I think bottom line is, there's no real right way or wrong way. Try something, see if it works. If it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, try a different way. Okay? It's, it's just a game. It's just a ride. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get it right first time. I'm not really qualified. This is a beauty. I'm not really qualified. First question is, are there qualifications? Right? If you're going to be a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon, yes, there are qualifications. Right? You need to have seven years medical school. You need to have worked in this and you know, work your way up the chain. You need to have lots of years of experience in theatre. You need to have, you know, be at the front of your profession. Right? There will be qualifications there. When it comes to marketing, web design, no. If there are qualifications, I haven't, I haven't heard about them. Here's the qualification that you need. Do you know more than your client? If you know more than your client, you're qualified. If you don't know more, with your cli don't know more than your client knows, you're not qualified. Having confidence to say, I can do this, I am allowed to do this, I'm qualified to do this, it's mainly about just having confidence. It doesn't come from any. I can't bestow it on you. Nobody can bestow it on you, that confidence, the, or the, the, the permission to go out and do it. You have to just do it. You ever heard the, uh, the phrase, dress for the job you want, not the job you have? Or fake it till you make it. There's truth in some of that stuff. It's about saying, this is who I choose to be, right? This is who I choose to be. This is who I am now. And you go out and you act that out. It's the be, do, have, have, do, be stuff all over again. You know, we're tempted as we're growing up to think, oh, if I only had this, then I'd be happy and then I could do the things I want, right? No, or I could do the things I want, then I'll be happy. In actual fact, it's the other way around. If you choose to be it first, then you will act and do the things that are natural for that kind of person to do. You know, if you say, yes, I'm a consultant, you go and be a consultant, then you will have the reward of a consultant. You can't wait for it to come. It's not external. It starts with you. This is a slide that I've been wanting to make for quite a long time. And I just found the perfect picture. This is the herd. This is my theory of uh, knowledge and time. So whatever sector you're in of, um, of life, of the community, whatever it is, we're like, these are water buffalo, I believe, and they are migrating across the African plain. Every generation follows these journeys, right? But it's never quite the same. Important things to notice are, wherever you are in the herd, it's extremely unlikely that you're on the very, very edge of the herd. If you are, you're an absolute leader and good luck to you because there's no roadmap, okay? You have to make it up as you go. Most of us are on the trail at some point in the trail and there are people in front of us. There are people that have done something similar to what we've done before right and there are people behind us on the trail nobody has our exact perspective and our exact view of life nobody has got to this point through the exact same means that we've got there are always people ahead that can help guide you 
and you're a fool if you don't listen to that yeah if you don't read the books read the writings follow the advice of previous generations Isaac Newton said he saw further than his contemporaries because he stood on the shoulders of giants now your clients will be somewhere behind you on the trail right if they're not you're in the wrong business okay you have to know more than your clients you're, you're ahead of them you've seen what they haven't seen yet you've got experiences that they don't have so you can guide them to know where to go how to move forward and that's all it is it's all it's about if you are ahead of your client on the trail then you can give them value you can help them to proceed and that's all there is to it and the whole herd moves forward nobody knows everything nobody knows it all I the, I find that the the more that I learn the less I realize I know and one of the most important things is that I don't know Jack particularly when it comes to what customers want what customers of a particular website will want or how they're going to behave I have to open my mind completely every time you have to start fresh right and I am a consultant I'm quite comfortable with that I'm quite comfortable saying to a client I don't know the answer yeah but let's do a test let's find out next excuse leads on from that what if I don't know how to do something what if I come across something that is beyond my experience and beyond my knowledge well if you're doing it right you've got spare time to find out okay it's just the same with a, a website I don't know how to do this let's see if there's a widget that'll do it let's type it into Google and see if somebody's written that line of code that I can just grab to do what I need to do you've always had spare time to find out so far so if a client comes to you with a new problem that you've never faced before a you've got spare time to find out B you can phone a friend right there are other specialists out there you can connect with them on LinkedIn right I, I'm talking with a guy um, in Australia who's a branding expert right he's into online branding so I can learn from him about online branding and if I have an online branding problem I can go to him Brian has been online um, Brian has got in particular expertise and tools and skills in uh, content strategy right that, that I can't go near it doesn't devalue me right but I know Brian so if I get one of those problems I'm gonna call Brian in I, I know people just by practicing what I practice and you know and going out there into the world I know people that I can pretty much turn to with almost any problem so if I get something that I don't know how to handle phone a friend the world isn't going to come to an end right plus you can always say to a client I don't know this is new to me but I'm gonna go find out and that will give a client a lot more confidence than if you have a go guess and mess it up you can always test as well where it's possible to test and then that brings us on to the third section what to do so just quickly review the first two great reasons to be a consultant you really should want to be a consultant to specialize to work with better clients for more money and have more spare time to get better at what you do and then continually improve right, we don't want to get to advanced years still doing the same kind of thing over and over again right and, and you would be undervaluing yourself devaluing yourself and devaluing the investment that your parents have put into you bringing you into the world and your educators have, have given you right not to use it to the very best of your ability and when you do that you can generate wealth that you can then share around other people as well by paying them to do the stuff that you don't want to do that you don't have to do there's a lot of excuses why you know we think that we can't be consultants right? but those tend to be false so assuming that we can that it's just down to a choice what should we do what's the first steps well the, the most important thing I think is picking your niche try and look for something that's 
unclaimed, like a crossroads, yeah, where one kind of road meets another kind of road. Like my friend Steve, um, I wrote about him in How to Be Number One. If you haven't read How to Be Number One, definitely read through it. It will help you immensely in this. Uh, so Steve Pope has loads and loads of experience with the European Union and red tape and legislation has helped people with that with uh, funding applications for years and years that was his job as a consultant his passion in life was golf he's actually a golf course designer as well he loves golf so then he set up a consulting business consulting to the golf industry about European Union legislation so if somebody needs to know what the impact of the new uh, you know, uh, water regulations are going to be on golf courses in Spain. Steve's your guy. He's the only guy. He is the guy for that. So he's got a crossroads, that little crossroads where the world of European red tape and legislation meets the world of golf. You rock up there, you'll find Steve on his stall with Golf Europa. So we all need a niche. Now it doesn't necessarily need to be a combination of two things, right? The answer is already there. We're not trying to create anything new. We just have to peel away the layers of the onion and find out what it is that makes you unique. Now, I've got this image here of this like pointy star. So I was, I was thinking about this kind of an enemy shape, this, where the, you've got this kind of mass in the middle, this dense mass in the middle, which is your generalists. And there's a lot of generalists. Right? But the further away you get from that, the more specialized you get until you get to an absolute point. And right on the end of that point is where there's the one person, the one person in that particular area. And your value gets higher. You get sharper the nearer you get to those points and your value get increases because there's no one really around you. So what makes you unique? And here's just a few examples. I would recommend if you if you're listening back to the to the recording of this get a pad and paper a, a pad and pen and and write down what is your experience okay what are the attributes of you skills particular things sense of humor talents languages whatever it is what have you been trained to do what's your training right it's it's amazing how we are so tempted to undervalue or devalue the things that we've done and always think, oh, the grass is greener on the other side. You look at somebody else and you think, oh, they've done that. It's great. We forget about the great stuff that we've done. I forgot for years that my mum taught me the visual language of art. Just took it for granted. Everyone knows that, right? No, sit down, write it out. What are these skills? What's all the training that you've had, the qualifications that you've got? What's the special knowledge that you've got? What are your interests? Now, if you're not passionate about something, it's hard to get motivated about it. Write down what your greatest successes have been. Why were they, why were those successes successes? What special powers have you got? And also, what great things has anyone else said about you or about your work? So what we're doing is we're looking for clues to say what's special about us. Not just special, but what's actually unique. Remember, nobody else is where you are right now. Nobody else has had the exact combination of experiences, of education, right, of life lessons that you've got. So nobody else can do exactly what you can do. So what we're trying to find is the thing that you can do that nobody else can. So you say, what is that thing? What is it? I don't know. I can't tell you because it's in you, not in me. Here are some ideas for you know, qualities that you can offer. I'll just read through the list. Okay. So what we're talking about is benefits that you can deliver to a client, which derive from that other stuff that we were looking at. Right? from your experiences, your special powers, blah, blah, blah. Here are just a few, and there's a lot more than these. Can you offer speed? 
you know, do you want to? Do you want to say, I am the paratroop, but if I get a, you know, a call to do this, you'll have the response in an hour, or 24 hours, or seven days? What about reliability? Is that part of your makeup? Are you a reliable person? Right? What do your friends say about you? you know, do you always turn up on time? Exclusivity could be a great one. I only deal with one client or whatever in each particular area. Right? I only do this. Availability. It's good. I am available 24-7 when I'm not on holiday. You can contact me anytime. Dedication. Attention to detail. Right? Some people, if you, if you do a, like a, a psychometric test or whatever, and um, you know, it tells you that you are somebody with a great attention to detail, then that could be a strength. Use that, because some people need that. Some situations need that. That isn't particularly my thing. I know it's not me. So that it wouldn't be part of what I do. What about perfectionism? That's a tweak on that. Do you have unique methods? Have you developed your own ways to do stuff? Or have you been taught distinctive, unique ways of doing stuff? Can you guarantee results? Is there something about your ethics that will make you stand out? About what you will do, what you won't do? What about culture? Cultural or ethnic or religious sensitivity? Do you understand a particular group? in a special way? Do you have any special insights that could be brought to bear? You know, like somebody who's had 10 years of legal experience and moving into another field says, I bring 10 years of legal experience. What about connections? Relationships that you've built up over time? People that you know? Anything else about your unique perspective? That, you, that can become part of your, your offering, your proposition to your clients. Something else that I would suggest as an exercise is to remember your greatest client. Sorry, remember your greatest triumph. And to say, well, what? picture it. Picture how it felt. Right? Now, if you struggle to remember your greatest triumph within living memory, that's a bad sign. It might be a sign that you need to be taking this a bit more seriously and, and moving on and upwards, right? We, we, we should all be enjoying very satisfying successes if we are using all of our abilities, all of our special powers. So visualize it, how did it feel? What did you hear, see, sense? And then ask yourself, what was it that you did that was great, that made that success a triumph? And also, what didn't you do? What didn't you do that you might normally have done otherwise, that you, you know, didn't do that time, which helped it to succeed? And are there any clues in that? Because right, what you want to repeat is, that feeling. You want to focus on that memory of, wow, I am so proud of myself. Because you should be proud of yourself if you're exercising your best talents. I'm proud of myself every week. I've been doing these webinars every week and I've set myself a challenge, big challenge, every week for about the last 13 weeks to come up with a new webinar. Right? And I've surprised myself every single time. I am proud of myself for this work. Very proud of it. And when we're thinking about what you did do and what you didn't do, what you don't want, what you don't do is very, very important. It creates who you are through the illusion of negative space. Right? We've I've just done this, the Ultimate Web Design series. And that we chose the logo for Ultimate Web Design as this horseshoe-shaped magnet. And the reason is, uh, yes, it makes the letter U for ultimate, but it also reflects the principle of polarization, which is very important. And um, the polarization works whereby you say, this is what I do, right? And this is what I don't do. 
okay these these are the clients that I take on these are the clients that I don't deal with these are the kind of people I work the only kind of people I work with I will not work with this 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 and this now that says a lot about you it does it says a lot about what you're like it says a lot about what your values are and it really helps people to complete their picture about what you could offer them so make sure you think about okay this is what I wouldn't do right so I won't work with porn smut gossip pretty much um, anything to do with arms and armaments um, or any hate stuff right I had a prospect once who wanted me to work on a, a site that was kind of Israeli propaganda um, I looked at it and it was, it was like a news site I looked at it and thought I don't like I don't like this I don't like this is this is hate speech I, I'm not into it I went back to him and said I can't you know I, I won't even proceed and knowing when to say no and saying no as quickly as possible can save you a lot of time and a lot of heartache by taking on work that you don't want to do. So, here's a really simple two-step process that you can use to build your profits right now. Okay? Step number one, stop charging clients $50 an hour. Step number two, start charging clients $400 an hour or more or the equivalent of anyway because I'm not telling you to, to start charging by the hour, but just, just stop it. Stop quoting $6,000. If you want to catch a big fish, stop throwing little fish bait into, into the water. So, that was that. Quick process. Let's get on to billing and pricing and stuff like that. Right, The actual practicalities. Obviously, if you want to be a consultant, you need to get yourself a business card that says your name and something consultant on it. Okay, you need to change your website so it doesn't say blah blah web design, but blah blah web consulting or whatever it is. Okay, that goes uh, goes without saying. Now, billing and pricing and stuff like that. Okay, here are just some ideas because, like I said before, try something. If it works for you, great, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, try something else. Right? Here are some ideas, some suggestions from me. Bill monthly. It's much, much nicer to have a client that's going to pay you every month to do your best work. Now, if your message, we're going to talk a lot about word. We've been talking about word in the previous webinar as well. Your word is, this is what I declare I am, what I declare I do, who I declare I do it for. Right? Now, the reason why you've been doing the work that you've been doing whether or not you are a freelancer or part of a group or you're in an employed position the reason why you do the work you do is because you, that's the work that you've requested right? you've, gone, you've applied for that work you've accepted that work that's what you do if your website says I do this, that and that don't be surprised when you get it so what we're saying is change it now one of the biggest changes you can do is to say I'm going to switch from working on a pro per project basis or a per hour basis to a ongoing consulting relationship so Mr. Client you know the the way it works is that you will pay me ten thousand dollars a month and for that I will deliver this it's very simple you need to bill at a rate that will make sure that you can afford the the money and the time that you need to keep yourself sharp to keep yourself on top of your game to keep yourself developing and you don't want to take on 10 clients at $500 a month if that's going to take up all of your time and just be breaking even so we're not necessarily talking about an hourly rate now but we're talking about if you want four clients how much do you need to be receiving from those four clients in a way that's going to give you the, the, the time and space that you need? And ideally, you want to be able to do this. You want to be able to break even with one client. Easy in, easy out terms. This is something I like the idea of. 
rather than complicated contracts, we've been thinking and talking about kind of no win, no fee, CPA, uh, profit sharing kind of relationships with clients. It's all a bit complicated and legalistic, right? In, in the office that I'm in now, it's easy in, easy out. You, know, you want to take an office, there's no deposit, you pay your first month, you move in, right? If ever you want to move out, you stop paying and you move out. Simple. And client relationships can work the same way. So Derek's asking what CPA is. CPA is cost per action, so you get paid every time something specific happens. So if I say to you, I'm going to build up your, build your sales from 50 a month to, you know, 70 or more or 100 or whatever, then we might agree that I get paid a proportion of the extra profit that you make. Okay, so every time a sale is made or a lead is generated, we agree a price on that and you get paid that way. Right, a lot more complicated. Plus, if, if I have stratospheric results, the client's going to sit there thinking, well, why am I now paying this guy 25% of all my profits? You know, so it could create a bad taste as well. Then you get moving on to things like sliding scales, which can make it even more complicated. So what we need to do is we need to identify the benefits that clients want. They want increased sales. Okay, well, how much is it worth to you to get increased sales? Let's trade. And then easy in, easy out. If at any point the relationship is unnecessary, you don't need the services anymore, you can call it off or we can call it off. Okay, that's it. And we're talking about delivering value, not hours. We want to avoid the hourly rate. I do have an hourly rate. Okay, $800. If somebody wants to hire me as a consultant for an hour, it's $800. Hourly pricing is bad. And here's why. When you bill by the hour, your earnings are capped. They're limited by two factors. One is the number of hours, and the other one is the rate that you charge. The number of hours that you have available is fixed. There is an absolute limit, okay? And you can't push that limit of how many hours it's possible to work in a week too far without having a, a breakdown. Okay, so we, we've all got the same number of hours in a day and the same number of days in a week. The hourly rate, to some degree, is also dictated by the market. Right? If you publish an hourly rate, you tell a client, my rate is $800 an hour, then they go and speak to somebody else, my rate is $500 an hour, or there's, you know, most people are charging this area. It's, it's hard to break away too far from that if you're billing by the hour, which means that your earnings are pretty much capped, hours multiplied by the hourly rate. Plus, getting paid by the hour doesn't necessarily lead to optimal results, right? If you're amazingly gifted, amazingly talented at something, then um, you could get incredibly valuable results in a fraction you know, of, of the time it would take somebody else. So why should that person get paid more than you, if, you know, if, if you're billing by the hour? If I can crack your business problem in five minutes, right, um, do I deserve to get paid five minute fraction of $800? No. I deserve to get paid something that reflects the value of what I've given you. Because there's years of experience going into that. Hourly pricing is bad. Value based pricing is good. I'm going to give you a link to a, a whole book on this that I read this week that's very, very worth, worth reading. Right, value is not limited, and we define value by giving the client what they need. Give the client what they need. You've delivered something something that they need. We don't necessarily know what it is, right? But you, you figure that out with your client, and say, well, let's say we can boost your conversion rate. Let's say we can make your clients happier, uh, cut the response time, cut the number of returns or whatever. So value is not limited, and if we charge a proportion of the value that's generated, then our earnings also are not limited. And it stops being a question of time. It stops being a question of hours in the month. So what we've got to do is first interview all of our prospects 
to discover two things, right? Understand in depth where they are right now, what their problem is, what their pain is, yeah? What's not working? And then to understand in depth and in great detail where they want to get to. The value that you deliver comes from getting from A to B. Simple as that. So one thing I would add to that is, what is it worth to them to get to B? Okay? And if it's going to be worth $100,000 to them, maybe you should be charging ten dollars or $20,000 to get them from A to B. Okay? So instead of paying for your hours, your clients are paying for all your experience and all of your training and your dedicated attention. They're not buying you by the hour. And here's a little story, which I'll read to you. You may have heard this before. There's an old story about a multi-million dollar power plant that had mysteriously ground to a halt. All efforts to restart it had failed and an expert was brought in. After studying the problem for a few minutes, he took a hammer and hit one of the valves. With a rumble, the plant came back to life. Incredulous glances were shared, grateful cries and high fives were exchanged. Later, the expert's bill arrived for the amount of $10,000. The outraged executive in charge thought, all he did was hit a valve with a hammer, this bill is ridiculous. So he asked for an itemized breakdown, and the consultant responded with a bill that read, Hitting valve with hammer, $10. Knowing which valve to hit, $9,990. So what the executive didn't realize is that he was paying for years and years of experience and training that taught the guy. Now, the story may be completely made up. It's not really the point. But this guy, it had taken him years to understand his area to that degree that in five minutes he could deliver something valuable. What the executive should have been thinking is, this power plant has been offline for 24 hours now, right? Which means we're losing loads of money. And this guy comes in and for $10,000 he can get it back up and running? Bargain. But when we get stuck into thinking about hourly rates, it doesn't help us. This is something that I strongly recommend you uh, look at after this call. Get hold of this book. Now, it's free. It's actually kind of... Uh, is it, is it shareware where you can donate an amount if, if it's been useful for you? It's called Breaking the Time Barrier. You can get it from breakingthetimebarrier.freshbooks.com. And it will take you between 30 and 60 minutes to read. And it is all about getting out of time-based pricing and into value-based pricing. Can't recommend it enough. Breakingthetimebarrier.freshbooks.com. Okay, so lastly, let's move on to marketing yourself. What can you do once you've decided this is my niche, this is my offering, you know, these are the particular benefits that I'm going to offer to my clients, and this is how I'm going to charge my time. How do you get out, out there? How do you market yourself? Well, here's a, just a few suggestions. Blogging can be useful, right? I would say if you're going to blog, blog really well, right? Don't hold back. Writing a book can be amazing. I've had a lot of work from people who've read Save the Pixel. Right? They read the book, and then a year later, they thought, no, our website's really important. Who do we know that's really good? I'm going to get the book guy that wrote the book. And the same thing has happened with Convert. I would say that the majority of the people who contact me to say, well, I work for them, have read one or both of those books. You can present at seminars uh, usually for free, usually unpaid, but it can position you as an expert, right? And if you're practicing in your particular area and you're doing research in your particular area and you've developed stories and case studies and examples in that area, that's really valuable. And people will love to go and listen and, and, and get some of that experience from you. Presenting webinars online, it's very, very convenient to do. Guest blogging, of course, positioning yourself on, on other people's sites, making use of their reach, even if you are starting from a standing start yourself, right? 
and also interviews. And, and I'm, here I'm talking about pick somebody in the uh, kind of subject area and interview them. Record the interview, publish the interview. A lot of people will be very pleased to give interviews. It's amazing how easy it is to do. I get requests from people that I've never heard of before to say, will you do an interview on a topic of your choice? Or I've got a bunch of questions to ask you, can I have an hour of your time? And this is going to go out to my mailing list. And I'll say, yeah, why not? Like, so I love talking about this stuff because I'm in an area where I'm genuinely passionate about. And I, lo I you know, love this information, love this work. And I love exploring it with other people as well and hearing their ideas and their reactions. So that's just half a dozen suggestions. If you've not read How to Be Number One, get hold of How to Be Number One. It's listed at $199, $197. If you want to get hold of a copy, email me and I will see if I can get a copy to you. That actually has a section middle section that has 41 different niche occupation tactics. It would be tedious to work through them all right now and I would lose my voice. But that has got 41 different ways where you, that you can position yourself as a niche expert. And uh, we're going to start winding up. I'm going to give you two absolutely killer marketing tips. If there are two things that I would offer you to say, if nothing else, do this. Number one, give it away. Give it away. Give it away now. Right. Take the best knowledge. Now, I've, I've talked about this in Save the Pixel, How to Be Number One, multiple webinars. I'm going to say it again because it's really, really important. There are two types of people out there. The majority doesn't need you right now. They don't have the problem, the pain, the budget, the need, the urgency to hire you as a consultant, right? Do not worry about that. Do not worry about those people. Put your knowledge, all your knowledge, out there, online, in free eBooks, on webinars, wherever it needs to go, YouTube videos, put it out there, right, without holding back. Some people who do not need to hire you right now, they haven't got the budget to hire you right now or the, or the urgency, right? Some of those people will read that knowledge, take it away, consume it, take it away for free. And some of them will replicate some of the stuff that you can do. That's okay, that's fine. Because a day may come when those people suddenly go, uh oh, now we suddenly need this. We need the best person to help us with this because it's really important now it's going to make a big difference to our bottom line who do we know and then they'll think that woman who put that video online or who wrote that book or whatever it is and because your brand because you're trusted you've proven your skill will be at the front of their mind and suddenly when they need a consultant you'll be there you'll be number one on the list and you'll be the first person they call the other group of people the people who d are desperate, they need a consultant right now, and they've got the pain and the urgency and the budget, all right? They can find the fee, okay? And if you put your knowledge out there and prove that you know what you're talking about and you can do it and you can get the results, right? Even if you haven't got the results, right? Just put it out there. Everything that you've learned doesn't even have to be original, because right? what's original? We're all following other people on the trail. Okay? You put your knowledge out there, they come across this, and they'll go, wow, this is the person that we need. Because they will always assume that you know a lot more than you've actually said. I'll tell this story. I had a, Somebody sent me the draft of an e-book a year or so, a few years ago now maybe, three years. And um, it was about writing ads copywriting and I read the this draft and I said mate this is absolutely amazing I think people would lap this up you should give this stuff out for free you should put this on the web this this draft and he came up to me and said I can't do that that's like two-thirds of the book to which my response was but nobody knows it's two-thirds of the book he thought that if he gave away that chunk of the book nobody would want to come and buy the rest of the book for $20 or whatever it would be, because they've had two-thirds of it for free. 
but the thing is, nobody knew that that was two thirds of the book, right? So if you read that and you go, wow, this is incredibly valuable, you know the value of it. And then there's a link to say, buy the full book here. I would have bought the full book because I'd already tasted and experienced and been proven the guy's skill and talent and value. My second killer marketing tip, which is incredibly important if you're getting off the line, if you haven't got the case studies, you're going from a standing start, okay? Offer a stupid, crazy guarantee. I had a client, uh, I've got a client at the moment who has hired me for some consulting and they've got a radical new product. Now, I can't say what area it's in, but the product promises to save corporations a significant chunk of money in a particular area. Now this client has had conversations and business meetings, sales meetings, when they've given a price and because they are unknown, unproven, the prospects have just said no, too much. Right? Even though this thing could save them millions. So my advice to this client was, right, we need First of all, a press release that says, defines this problem, okay, and this radical new uh, company, this startup, has created something that can now do this, right? And then here's the proposition. They are looking only for five clients, only five clients, right? And that creates urgency, scarcity. With these five clients, you will, we will train your people at our expense to use this new platform, right? Costs you nothing. We will train your people. We will support your, your people for six months at our expense. Okay? It costs you nothing. It costs you nothing until you know, and our software has shown that it has saved you $1 million in cash. At that point, and only at that point where you agree it has saved you a million dollars, we will start charging a fee, which is a fraction of what it saves you, okay? That is removing all risk entirely. So you should be offering, always look to offer the craziest guarantee you can, a guarantee that is so absurd, it makes your own palms sweat just to say it. Take the risk away from your clients and then do everything you can. You say to a client, okay, right, the fee is $10,000 a month, but if I don't deliver A, B, and C, right, the fee goes down to $5,000. If I don't deliver D, I will work for you for free until this happens. Because here's what's really important. What's really important out of this is not that you just get that money in the bank in the, in the first month, but you should be charging. I'm not saying work for free, right? Get the money. And knowing that that money will be more than you would have been earning before, you do everything you can. You beg, borrow, steal, phone a friend, right? Get a group around you, subcontract, read books, go back to school, whatever it is you need to do to get that work done and to deliver, deliver on that promise, okay? Pull out all the stops. We all know loads of stories about people who have blagged their way into jobs, right? And then have just had to learn on the hoof, you know, learn on the run. Offer a crazy guarantee to get people to say yes and then deliver on it. Do whatever it needs to take to deliver because then what you'll get is A, a happy client that will probably hire you again and B, an amazing case study which will then help you to get more clients. Do not be tempted to be stingy or reticent if you want to make the leap the chasm from being a generalist to being a specialist consultant. It's not in your interest to hold back. You need to break through the wall and the breaking through the wall takes 100% of your power, your effort. Don't give it 80% because you will hurt yourself. So there's my two massive tips for marketing. My final advice, if you can, rope up. Rope up with other people. Other people who are on the same journey as you. So here we've got an image of well, at least, I would say, five mountaineers. They're on Everest. Now, when they are working their way up the mountain, if they were all individual and separate, it's likely that 
one or nearly all of them or all of them would probably slip and fall and die. It's that precarious. When they're roped up together, if one guy slips, he, does, he got, can't go far because the other guys will help him. And then if somebody else slips, he can't go far because the other mountaineers will help him. And that's how it works. So what we're saying is form teams. Join together with other people whose skills complement you and who can support you if you slip and whom you can support if they slip. Because that way everybody gets higher, quicker and more safely. So if you're interested in joining forces, I know that uh, several people on the call today are already part of the Pro Web Design Alliance. Let me just tell you a little bit about what the Pro Web Design Alliance is about and where it's going. So I've had the Pro Web Design course. That's been running now for two and a half years. Hundreds of people have taken that course. In the last two or three months, we've then added another layer to it, which we call Ultimate Web Design, which is taking the practice of marketing online and designing web pages to the point where you can practically guarantee profits. And that's run for previous kind of 12 weeks, lots more content. Now, anyone who goes through the Pro Web Design course and the Ultimate Web Design, which is added onto the Pro Web Design course, is then um, invited to join the Pro Web Design Alliance. Okay. Currently, this is called uh, Pro Elite Groups. Um, at the Pro Web Design Alliance, my plan now is to, is to reposition this group of experienced web designers and marketers as a consulting group. And I would like to go out and find, I'm estimating, well, my, my initial goal would be about $100,000 per month worth of consulting work for this group to do. Okay, and we've got people who are experts in pretty much every area of web design, branding, positioning, marketing, SEO, everything that's required to make online projects highly successful. And so we are positioning, moving away from being individual web designers or producers or developers or SEO people to being a group of consultants. We're joining forces and roping up so that we can take on bigger projects. Whale hunting, if you like. So that's just a little bit of uh, insight into the way forward. If you haven't heard of the Pro Web Design course or the Alliance, then feel free to contact me, uh, ben at benhunt.net, and ask me about that, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you've got. Um, but that uh, brings us nearly to the end. So it's just the final statement, the final thing that I would implore you to do. If you have really taken on board the value and the desirability of becoming a specialist and becoming a consultant, then uh, and you realize that yes, it is possible for you because you are that valu valuable or you can be when you're not acting small, you're not playing the Clark Kent role. Okay and you pretty much know how to do it as well, it's just a case of doing it. And my biggest piece of advice here is to acknowledge and use or apply the power of your word, right? which is just to declare it. If you want to do it, don't wait for any other opportunity. This is the opportunity. It's right now. And um, declare yourself a consultant. Get that business card printed up. Get that page. You know, Edit your LinkedIn profile and just start doing it from, from, uh, from right now. If you need any tips or advice, then feel free to contact me as well. Um, it's gone on quite a lot longer than I, I was expecting, but uh, I will leave a little bit of time for questions and answers if anyone has any questions. But otherwise, um, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on today's call. I've enjoyed it a lot. I hope you have as well.